Okay, when I first heard the phrase called programming paradigm, I was perplexed. Um, I didn't grasp the core meaning of the word paradigm at all that time. All I knew then was there was no paradise on programming. Um, it's, it's just called rhyming, but these two words uh, have no relationship with each other. But uh, so, so, so what is programming paradigm anyway? I later learned that the word paradigm was about a pattern and a worldview represented by the underlying theories and methodology of a scientific subject. That's what we, what we call the paradigm. And in Wikipedia, you can see a definition of programming paradigms, quote, programming paradigms are a way to classify programming languages based on their features, unquote. So simply speaking, the word paradigm means the features for programming. It's not something uh, so much complicated or so, something so uh, hard to define or something. And oh, he's there. Professor Peter Van Van Looy over there, the first keynote speaker of this conference. Has, uh, I'm pretty much humbled he's there, but has published, has published a comprehensive, very comprehensive reference for the programming paradigm. It's called Programming Paradigms for Dummies. Publicly available on the web. Uh, he's so kind that he is such a comprehensive text, free on the web. You should read it right now. And um, in the document, he shows that Many languages belong to the same paradigm, which is a very, um, which is a very important point. Maybe, um, for example, Alan and Elixir may belong to the same paradigm, or even if C++ or C Sharp or any other language using or having Lambda function, they will employ the same paradigm as a function of programming languages. So, and a paradigm has many concepts, right? So it's, um, I, I'm just, I, I don't want to play about words, but it's about the, uh, how the words are structured. Languages and paradigms and concepts. And uh, Professor Van Looy's document actually explains 27 paradigms. And it indeed represents the complexity of the real world. I'm not going to repeat it, but um, 27 paradigms. So many paradigms are actually being used in a programming language. And let me summarize a rather casual definition of the word programming paradigm. It's about the language patterns, worldview, and the features. It also represents simplified characteristics of the features. And I like to define that it's a part of design philosophy of the language as a whole. So then what really, what really is the beam programming paradigm? This is my own idea. The philosophy of the beam language systems Lagom. How many people are here in Swe who speak Swedish? Great. You, want, you, you may all understand the concept of Ragon. I'm going to talk about you for the rest of the people <laughs> from now. It's, it's, a, it's a very great, great keyword of the Swedish culture, at least a part of Swedish culture. Okay, Ragon is a Swedish word explaining a state of not too much, not too little, and just right amount, quantity, or level of strength. There is a popular Swedish quote which says, Lagom is best, uh, which, 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 which stands for in English, Lagom is, is the best, which means just the right amount is best. So you don't take it too much, or, or, but you should take it to, to just the right amount you need. And you can find a, a few philosophical concepts similar to, similar to the word Lagom in the world. In China and Japan, the word tonyong or chuyo, chuyo is a Japanese, tonyong is Chinese. Also called the doctrine of the mean in English, mean stands for the mean value of mass or, or statistics. It's popular for not pursuing in the excessive ways, don't pursuing the excessive ways. That's the philosophical idea or ethics of the Confucianism. And in the old Greek ethics of Aristotle, it's called 
Mesotes, I think. I don't read Greek letters, I'm sorry. I, I just copied from the Wikipedia, actually, but Mesotes. And it's also called golden mean, and it's also translated into the same word as chuyo in Japanese, actually. And which is, it is about the desirable middle between the two extremes of the excess and deficiency. So, let me quote Joe Armstrong's words. Joe Armstrong writes in his book of Programming Ireland that creating a la oops, sorry. This is not Ragam, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I'm too short, but anyway. Ragam number of processes is essential for parallel processing. Uh, I think he, he just wanted to say, don't create too many processes, because um, pro cre creating too many processes itself means a lot of overhead. But uh, he introduced the concept of lagom here. And uh, one thing you should remember is that he's not Swedish. <laughs> he's, a, he's, he's a proud English person. So I guess he found the usage of lagom intriguing by, by himself. So he actually quoted here. And uh, I quoted here from the second edition of the Programmatic Bookshelves of the uh, Programming Alone, which, which was published in 2013. But I first found this expression in uh, the first edition of the 2007, and which was actually translated in 2008. And that was my first encounter to the Olin language. So this is my opinion. Computer is as greedy as people, and it's anti-logon anti and going totally opposite from the, the uh, what it should be. And um, I've been working in computer industry for almost 30 years. The industry is thoroughly anti lagom I found a steady tendency of greed among industry vendors and users. They always demand faster software with more features. And developers have to have to cut corners and deliver less secure software with an inefficient code. Um, Johnny Wynn, last, uh, yesterday's presenter, actually put it in uh, mud, mud bowl. Software is going to be a mud bowl, and it's going to be um, completely incomprehensible, unmanageable. And uh, he, he showed us a uh, very good principle that just deleted. I like it. I, I like it very much because uh, you have to re-engineer all the uh, mod-like software anyway. But if you don't have to do that, that would be more efficient, huh? efficient right? And the another story I've heard during uh, one of the past conferences of the All on Solutions is that Security and privacy are the last priorities for many st startup companies, if not all. Of course, this is understandable because they have to deliver the product first. But if you don't include security and privacy at the very beginning of, the, of making a product, you'll be in a big trouble. That's a uh, lot of companies have failed in that way. So anyway. Um, let me summarize about those stuff. Um, these are not good for the future of the industry. So let me go back to the Lagom philosophy of beam language. And the Lagom beam philosophy of beam language systems looks against the trend of faster and fancier software. Um, I had a discussion with um, online users in Japan, and some online users and Elixir users in Japan, and some claimed Elixir is fast. But the reality, the person wanted to say, is that Elixir was faster than Ruby on Rails. Do you understand what this means? It's fast. It's faster. It's good. It's good. It's fast. I, I think I, Joe, Jose has a, put a lot of effort on making a concurrent, making a very viable software for the, uh, actually making a game software for the concurrencies. But the issue is that uh, Elixir or Erlang can never be fast as a machine language or the CPU directory handle languages in any way. So then what those beam languages are going to do, or want to do? Let me quote, um, traditional 
uh, old saying of the telegraphy operator of 100 years ago or something. They say, accuracy transcends speed. Because you have to, uh, because about 500 years ago or, so, or more, you have to, you had to type the most key by your hand. So the, if you type, if you, if you key faster, the code output from the switch of the key will get blurred and with inaccurate timing, and it's go, it's, it's a, the accuracy declines as the speed goes up. So there's a trend, there, they want, the, the old saying wants want to say that there's a trade-off between accuracy and uh, speed. So I'd like to extend this principle into modern software. Safety transcends speed. Simplicity transcends rich features. I hope so, but stability transcends convenience. Although lots of people want convenience, but the stable software, well, convenient software without stability means nothing. Uh, without stability, software would be nothing, unusable. So thinking a bit about Lagom, or the just right way of using programming resources, will get you closer to actualize these targets and make, you, make your software a better one. That's what I've learned from the uh, Joe's quote of Lagom Airbest. So let me get back to the topic of programming paradigms. Professor Peter Van Loy over there state, states Earn has four major paradigms in his, in his document. Functional programming, message passing concurrent programming, multi-agent programming with the Earn processes. And he, he also stated, also he, the Earn also include, includes some shared states such as the process dictionary, ETS, and Amnesia. Miriam Pena over there. Uh, actually explained a lot about that. <laughs> there are many other people uh, actively, actively, um, how do you say, promotes using the atomics or counters or ETS. These are actually good things if you use properly. But I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about those uh, shared data stuff. Okay, so. I was, uh, as I'm an Erlang program, I'm, to, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm mainly talking about Erlang, but uh, all these paradigm measurements are also equally adaptive to Elixir and other Beam languages. Okay, on the other hand, Beam programming languages have their own hidden paradigms or design philosophy. I'd like to summarize them as safety, safety first, speed second, or logum speed principle. I'd like to talk about three major points. Strong and enforcing immutability, especially on variables. Deep copied storage handling, which is so obvious to Erlang and Elixir people, but not so obvious to the rest of the world. And given exceptions to these restrictions when the programmer has to take risks, such as ETS or <laughs> atomics or counters, or all those shared subjects, or maybe global namespace. So let me talk about the immutability. Erlang and Elixir both enforce strong immutability. All variables in both languages are immutable, which means once the values are stored in those, they cannot be changed, or they will not be changed. All no immutable or mutable states are explicit, explicitly defined as external functions, including the process dictionary and the processes themselves. So you can't be immutable unless you really want to. It's a matter of default mode. Default mode, immutable. You, if you want to make it mutable, you have to do something special. Okay. So this enforcement of immutability makes debugging easier because all st stored values of the created objects are freely traceable. Um, if you are going to debug C or C sharp or C++ program in the GDB or Visual Studio, you have to trace all the changes of the variables, right? But on ERM or even on Elixir, you don't have to do that because you, all those past traces are there. So you just, you just um, look at it and you look at it one by one and then you can find the changes and all the records are there. And that is much more easier to maintain. Okay, um, as I'm 
an online person, there was, I, I had confused that Elixir actually used a different style of bindings. Um, let, me, let me compare the two languages. Alan allows a single binding only and the pattern matching. And, and the equal sign implicitly means the pattern matching. On the other hand, Elixir allows multiple binding for the variables, which can be changed to allow the pattern matching only by the pin operator. Let me talk about the details. This is a simple example. So simple. Uh, sorry about the lead letters. But A equal 10. And the, this is the first binding of the variable A on Olang. And uh, if you try to bind A equal 20, you will fail. Because this is, A has already been bound by some value or some object. So the second line is, uh, actually trying to match patterns or compare patterns so that this will fail. Each variable can only be bound once and only once. So when you bind variable B as one and two, yeah, this is a list. And um, in Ellen, you see this kind of pattern extensively so that B could be anything. And Whoops, B could be anything, and how should I say? Oh well, I'm sorry, I made a mistake on making this. <laughs> this should be one and two bra and cat here. I'm sorry, I made a mistake, but X should be X here, and B should be here, okay? So this is the, this is the, this is the um, explanation on pattern matching here. And, um, when I saw this single binding variable principle, I'm so perplexed, but uh, well, immediately I understood how this was rational, because this has two advantages. The so first one is that they make debugging even more easier, because when you assign a variable, it's, it's always the same. It remains the same until the function exits. Function exits, I mean. And the second one is that the meaning attached to every variable must be clearly defined once you're going to try to use it, because you cannot rebind, rebind it anyway. But um, this is, there's an explanation of Joseph Alim, creator of El Elixir. He made a very good argument when uh, Alum people uh, questioned him why Elixir cho has chosen multi-assigned variable uh, assignment. And um, he showed this example that in a case expression, this is kind of not intuitive. You have to be very careful to understand this. But when the case ANXPR, this is function, and if S is not bound and the ANXPR returns two element tuple, then S would be the second element of the tuple of ANXPR returns. If you don't understand immediately about this, uh, you, can do the, you can do it as an exercise. Maybe you can do, run it on, uh, on, um, on an actual machine. But when S is bound to something before the case statement, suddenly this turns into a pattern matching. So if ANXPR's second element is not the bound value of S, actually it's an atom called something, then the matching fails. And there will be some trouble. So. Jose actually explained this, um, this ambiguity very well in his own words. So um, I have put oops, yep, this Jose Varim comparing Elixir and all variables. Uh, he has published the, um, this article in uh, in 2016, as his employee, uh, as an 
article of uh, his employer's blog of Plataforma Tech. So I suggest you to read it thoroughly uh, to why, why, why Elixir and On is, are different and why they are still different and uh, why programmers are not confused by it. Because um, it's a difference of default behavior, but uh, okay, I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna ba explain back to the Elixir side of the thing. Okay, well on Elixir, you can assign 10, A10 first, then you can assign A20 the second. The second, the, all variables on Elixir, rebinding is allowed, so A will be 20 anyway. And, but if you put the pin operator, which is a caret, before the A, and you try to assign something else like 40, then it will fail because the pin operator explicitly enforces stands that this equal sign is a pattern matching, not a rebinding. So Elixir put in this way to avoid, um, un avoid ambigu ambiguity of the assignment. So let me stand on the Elixir side. Allowing the rebinding of variables in Elixir actually have two advantages. The first one is that it's easier for the programmers to understand because many, if not most of, most of the programming languages, allow reassignment to the variables from Fort, maybe from the age of Fortran or age of Cobol or whatever, maybe on basic or Perl, Python, Ruby, whatever. And the second one is, if, is that if that pin operator can be used to remove the ambiguity of rebinding, it, uh, Elixir designer thinks it's better than Erlang. At least for their stand, their stand, their position. I'm not trying to start a frame war about that, but uh, there are the, 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 the important point is that Elixir people actually did it intentionally, and, and they have a, their own deep thoughts and rationalization. And I think they have uh, their rationalization is good, as well as Alan's Alan's rationalization. Okay, so let me explain the case expression in, on Elixir. In the previous three bound variable S here. This, I'm sorry, I'm sh so short. <laughs> this statement over there of the two were matched. And we'll, we'll give, we'll rebind the variable S anyway. Because rebinding is allowed always, as always. So if the programmer does not want to rebind the existing variable, variable S, which is called our previous value, then the programmer should put a caret sign here so that this won't be executed as a rebinding. Okay. So the reason why I uh, talk about uh, took so much time on, on talking about this is that this is one of the core issue of uh, the beginners of Erlang or Elixir gets confused so easily, and it takes time f for them to understand, especially if if they have to uh, use use both languages. You have to switch your mind mind a lot. So, okay. So let me talk about another topic. Let me talk about the deep copied variables of Erlang. This is an example of how Erlang treats structured objects such as lists. In this example, a list B is created with one of the elements of the A, A on the top, which is actually 10. And A becomes unbound by Allen shell pseudo function F. Allen shells has a pseudo function called F. Uh, forget it. And even this happens, the old A, old A's object, actually 10, number 10 is still remaining intact within the B. So even, even though the variable A is unbound, the B is 
remains the same. This is what we call immutability. Okay. And on Elixir, things are the same. I'm using a slightly different example. Okay, A and B uses A as 10 and 30, a two element list over there. And if you change, or well, better say, rebind A to 20 and shows A and B, then this first one is 20, so it's, uh, it re represents the new A. And the B still remains here unchanged, although the old variable, old variable A is rebound. So this is what we call immutability. And um, I think this immutability is common among the languages based on the deep copying semantics. And I see deep copy variables have two major advantages. The first one is that they are inherently immutable because the copying action always creates a new object body. Copying action means create a new object body. And the second one is that the copy semantics is consistent regardless of the data types. Uh, data types means uh, from simple types like integer or atom or to um, lists, tuples, or records, or whatever, maps maybe. Okay, and um, they are all treated as the same in uh, deep copied variables. And um, there are some claims that deep, deep copying the variables are not good. There are two reasons. It's slow because you have to copy all the stuff under, under the, under the uh, variable structure. And it, it, it would take much more memory space. But I'd like to disagree with that because already we have uh, lots of lots of gigabytes, or maybe we'll soon have a terabyte of memory, and uh, lots of CPUs and lots of cores, and lots, and um, already uh, lots of languages have become garbage, using a garbage correction rather than the uh, using their uh, using a manual manual assignment manual what do you say assignment of a heap and removal of a heap. Um, so, do we really care about those disadvantages? This is, I'm just making a question. Maybe that, that might be yes or no in many cases. And for beam languages, beam languages are using garbage correction, and these high cost operations are highly optimized, very much optimized. You will be, you will be surprised how uh, Alan or let's say beam, beam, beam virtual machine manages um, binaries or any other shared objects. When you have the small integers, large integers, those are very carefully designed. Okay. So let me talk about my story, some of my stories. For the 10 years since 2007 till 2017, I didn't write much code in anything but Erin and Elixir. Fortunately, but after a while, I worked on C Sharp and C++ for making my own living from the October 2018 to May 2017 to May 2018. I realized that many of the programmers in the world were living in completely different programming paradigms. There are two major differences. I would summarize in two. The first one is that variables are not necessarily immutable. And many, many people think variables are immutable. Not say, sorry, my, my English. Variables are mutable, not immutable. And the second one is that copy semantics are complex and differ between different data types. So let me show you the Lisp example. This is a common Lisp code. You don't have to read it. Um, all, you want, all you have to know is that these two a very weird name of functions called, um, as, as written in the uh, website of the rails, they say repraku and repraku d. You don't have to remember these words, but uh, these two functions begins with R. Actually, destroys the list of the header part, head part, and tail part of the list, and substitute with the given uh, atom elements like uno or not nil. So these are the results 
Uh, for some unknown reason, uh, common list output on all capital letters, but anyway. One, two, three, four, this is the original one. And when you replace, try to replace the head part of the list, it's going to be uno. And the tail part of the list, it even becomes a non-proper list. Uh, the last one is not the uh, empty, empty, empty atom. So it's dot, not nil. So what this means is that being a functional language does not necessarily mean it's an immutable language. And um, so you can do a lot of destructive things and dangerous things in Lisp. Okay. And I like this JavaScript example very much. And the copying in, in JavaScript, I actually run, run, ran this on the Node.js. Um, this one, first one, second two, this is called what we call object on the JavaScript. And if A is, OK, let, let me give A over there, which we begin the bar A statement. And, B, and when you make an assignment of an A to, D, to B, and it's, the result is the same. But when you make a change, a part of the A to something else, B is also changed. This is because A and B are sharing a pointer, or reference only, no, no deep copying. And I really like that this part. If B, if, if you try to compare B with the, this uh, something, it, absolutely represented equal to the this one, <laughs> the JavaScript returns false. Why? Because this creates a new object. So this object and B is no longer the same. Do you understand this semantics? Actually, I don't. <laughs> And the, you have to deal with the same problem on the C++ and C sharp constructors. Every time you have to think about how you create the object by yourself. It's a programmer's job on C++ and C sharp. And this is another example on the C sharp and how it treats differently of the mutability of the object. When you change objects given as arguments like this. I actually tried to change i, an integer, from 100 to 200. And the list over there, and I attach something to the, to the, at the end. This is an um, append operation. The result I got is that integer doesn't change. It's immutable. But a list is not immutable. It's mutable. So when you change this, change this list inside a function, the actual object got, got changed. And the, the problem is that the um, mutability of the variable changes between different data types. This is so confusing. And I don't want, even want to talk about this. How many of you, how, how, many, how many of you pro have programmed C++? Would you please raise your hands? Great. And uh, how many people can understand the difference of the first four statements? Would you please raise your hand if you, if you have? I only changed all these argument part. And the first one is, uh, just very standard standard vector. Uh, the second one is actually passed by reference. Reference means no copying. And the third one is uh, copied by as a unique pointer. And if you want to do this, you should not use copying. You have to use a method called standard move, like this. If you try to copy a new unique pointer on C++, you will get an error for some reason. And when you, you can copy a pointer called shared pointer, 
But the shared pointer has its own semantics. So if, if you once make a pointer, a shared pointer, you should take it as a shared pointer uh, throughout the end of the program. So why you have to have these different semantics of all these, of a simple data structure? Um, it's, I think it's all about how to optimizing the copy. But is this something programmers have to think? I object. So let me summarize. These languages perplex me by different actions for different data types. They have constructors or destructors, maybe. And copy semantics is so complicated. And they are copying, copy, the, the copy operation of these objects are shallow. Shallow means reference only. And they shared state and reference as default. The default mode is still opposite from the Erlang or Elixir or any Beam languages. And I understand the design of these languages are mostly for speed, avoiding object copying, using less memory, and make the object isolation the programmer's responsibility. And I have to say, they make the programmers program unsafe just because of that. Because of the, the default mode is unsafe. When you put the default mode is unsafe, everything becomes unsafe because the, it's a kind of gravity. I'm not going to claim any kind of data gravity, by the way. You don't have to understand this joke. You can ask you later. OK. What beam language pro languages provide? The default mode, same actions for all data types. This is so good. You can copy a list or copy an entire binary or whatever of a whole structure by assignment to A equal B or B equal C or something. And you don't have to construct something explicitly. And that is, that is so easier to understand. And it's a single only one only copy in semantics, and all objects are deep copied. And no shared state, no, no reference. You cannot refer or pointer, or make a pointer of the, uh, the, of a variable unless you are explicitly trying to do as a function, functions operation, such as ETS or atomics or counters. So I understand the design of beam languages are not for speed, but for making the object isolation without big hassles of the program. I think this is one of the reasons why the beam languages, including Erlang and Elixir, are safer and secure, while trying to provide log or more just enough speed for safer computing. So let me summarize. So what the beam program, programming paradigm, paradigm really is? I think in one sentence, it's a choice of the default data copying mode. That's it. That's the only it. And this makes the world so changed, so different from the object-oriented programming world. Okay. So I'd like to ask you one question. Is shared state or distributed state or shared state or anti-shared state, which is safer, which is more secure, which model causes less bugs? I'm not saying Erlang or Elixir or Beam languages are always safe, always safer, but they try to be safer because they are putting the default mode on the safer side. So I intentionally excluded lots of topics from this talk because Beam architecture is not my topic. It's Derek Spenman's topic. Uh, if you want to read the Beam virtual machines architecture, just uh, read his Beam book. It's a very excellent document. And the concurrency models, process supervision and signals, how beam language handles shared state. The last one is a very complex topic, uh, and a lot of other people have already made a very good, or better say, excellent presentation in this conference. So I don't do that. Okay, so lastly, I'd like to thank my spam, uh, sponsor, Pepabo, and the Institute of GM Pepabo for supporting this presentation, and to the Code Beam crew and our own solution as always. And I, I do appreciate you being here. And uh, I, let me allow, would you please allow me to give one tribute to Joe Armstrong. He's a creator of Erlang, who taught me Lago best for programming. 
and help me to get out of C code of ISC by nine through his programming error on first edition booklet in 2008, or otherwise I would have died as a C programmer. I'm not blaming C programmer, but uh, I would, uh, but uh, you know, narrow-minded. Uh, well, let me say, now narrow-minded thought will kill you anyway. So, and I was very much impressed by Joe's personality, Joe's hospitality, and Joe's inquisitive mind with everything. Um, I, I have to confess one thing. I, will, um, I think it's already on Twitter, so it's made public. But he wanted to come to Japan on this march, but he couldn't. It was too bad. And maybe, I'm, maybe I have to. I can say that I'm sure we all remember him. So thank you. We have time for two questions. Okay. Uh, hello. Hi. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, you mentioned that you can have mutable state in Lisp, although it's a functional programming language. And I would say that if you have local mutable state, you're just not a functional programming language. So if if you can have mutable state in a functional programming language, then what makes it a functional programming language? I, I would like to ask the same question to you. <laughs> because I have no answer. And maybe Professor Peter Van Moy wouldn't <laughs> might not have an answer for this because you know, it's it it's I don't think it's I don't think the Mutability, I, I think mutability or immutability is a orthogonal subject from the whether it, whether the paradigm is functional or not imperative or uh, how should I say object oriented programming because lots of lisps or lisp uh, der der lisp derivatives such as scheme they have all assignments to the variables already and they are useful. They're useful, and if you really want to make th everything pure functional, it's really hard to do with every other thing. So um, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm not a born fun functional program. I actually had. The, I actually have a very much inferior complex about all those extra tough functional programs around here. But um, pure, purely doing things are my. It's my opinion. It, it might not be applicable to anyone, but it's. I don't think it's useful. Okay. Is that is it my answer? <laughs> oh, it's okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kenji. Thanks a lot.